Hello and welcome to the Nature Garden Podcast with me, Carl Steinson, and the Weekend In Show team from Lionheart Radio. Come along with us as we take a bonny wee wander down the garden path and country lane with the birds and the bees and the flowers and trees, and it's a chance to hear some great music and Northumbrian stories on today's show. Enjoying your gardening is the name of the game, but Tom Pattinson's got some wise advice that could really make a difference and keep you safe. Idas are one of Northumberland's joys, and Tom Cadwallader is down on the waterline with the Cuddy Duck. We're also joining a celebration of cherries with John and Dean from the Yannick Garden. And we've got an amazing story about a pied flycatcher. Plus some top tips for the garden from Tom P. All coming up on the Nature Garden Podcast. Gardening is one of those things that I got drawn into as a young'un, planting bulbs, and I caught the bug. But there's always something to learn, whatever your age, about keeping safe. And so speaks the man here who's done that very painful comedy rake-in-the-face routine. Hmm. Well, Tom Pattinson's here to help us all. Ah, good old British summer time. What a beautiful time to be around. Last week, we had consecutive days of 20 degrees Celsius plus. Oh, excellent weather. Sunning, doing a bit of work and then relaxing. And that's the place we can relax, in the garden, you think, most of the time. Sun rises at 4.30 in the morning, 4.30 a.m. And doesn't set until 9.30 in the evening. This is the beginning of June. Far cry from those dark winter days. It's a pleasure to be alive and out there. And one of the most relaxing places I can think of. But you know, there are problems. Hidden problems that some people just do not see. Health and safety and risk assessment are phrases you normally associate with the workplace. But they can apply to the garden. There is danger lurking in there. It's a negative thing to say, but it's a fact. I was reading some figures from a a website put together by the Royal Society for the Prevention of Accidents, ROSPA for short, and one of the lists they gave was the top ten of accidents that occur in the garden. And you wouldn't be surprised to hear some of the items that were on there. The use of lawnmowers, flower pots, Secateurs and pruners, spades, electric hedge trimmers, plants, tubs and troughs, shears, garden forks and hoses and sprinklers, garden canes and sticks. Do you know, it's probably time to check your garden out and ask yourself, is this really the safe, relaxing place it's supposed to be? And more so if there are children able to wander free and play in the garden. Think about those plants. Are all of those plants safe? Just take a walk around. Say, the pathway. Are they uneven, the flags, if it's flagged, if it's crazy paven? Is there moss or slime on them? There's a high risk, generally, that someone falls, and quite often people take a fall in the garden. There are hundreds of thousands of accidents in the garden each year and recorded of people going to hospital. I'm sure there are many more thousands of people who decide, oh, I'm okay, just a scratch or a bruise, but it's an accident all the same, and they don't go to hospital. On your walk around, look out for garden debris, pieces of wood, broken glass, rusty metal, canes. They're just as dangerous. 
Has someone been using the hose? If so, have they left it uncoiled? Will someone else trip over it? I hope it's been wound up after use. You know, the old rake against the wall, the, the tines of the rake resting on the ground about two feet from the wall and the top of the rake resting against the wall, just ready for someone to walk past innocently, stand on the hollow tines, on those tines and the shank comes and hits them in the head. It does happen. Think before you start any gardening activities, hedge trimming and cutting the lawn, strimming where there's working parts, blades capable of leaving a nasty cut, serious cut. Do you wear protective headgear, uh, eye covers, suitable footwear? They're all necessary. And if you use garden canes to stake something, do you leave the top of the cane showing or do you put some sort of plug on it to protect your eyes? Many of the accidents are people bending down to examine a plant, not seeing the cane or the stick pointing upwards and receive eye damage. Oh, there's so many different ways in which you can harm yourself in a garden. And if you use chemicals, for goodness sake, fertilizers, herbicides, insecticides, liquid or granular or powder form, please lock them away safely, safe away from children, use gloves and be sure you look after yourself. I'll continue this in a moment. Cuddy ducks are also known as eider ducks and they're out and about oo-ooing their way around our shorelines and Tom Cadwallader from the British Trust for Ornithology's observing a bird that has a very special relationship with the Northumbrian coastline. I'm currently sitting uh, overlooking the Alm Estuary, just a spidgen land of Almouth. Uh, you know the Alm Estuary. It's on the it's the River Alm, and it's uh, it's very very picturesque. And, and this time of year, it's quite nice actually because um, a lot of the the wintering birds have gone, and the the passage birds have largely gone. You know the wading birds and so forth. So we're just left to the breeding birds. And the last oh three or four years, um, we've been seeing sort of um, male and female eider ducks. Eiders are the county bird of Northumberland, as I'm sure you're aware. And the males are, are largely black and white and they have a little bit of a uh, little bit of green at the back of their heads. But the females are, are cryptically plumaged, really brown and, um, and, and streaky and, and so forth. Well, they have to be because they'll, they'll sit in, on their nests for, for several weeks and they'll sit and sit and sit and they need to be camouflaged to, to raise their, their young. But anyway, the... Um, they, we used to see kind of uh, eider ducklings coming into the estuary. Uh, and these birds were coming over from Coquit Island, which is just offshore here. And Coquit Estuary is the, is the real kind of place where they'll, they'll, they'll shoot into. But these little guys, these little ducklings, will, will travel quite a long way. And I was always confused whether they were locally bred or, um, or whether from Coquit. But actually, um, three years ago, I, I found a nest here on the Arl Nestuary, which I was so thrilled about. So I've actually proved that they do nest here. And last year was something similar. We did find young here. Uh, but this year, it's been fantastic. There's, there's, there looks to be about five or even six broods, and, uh, which is absolutely tremendous. And, and I wasn't sure whether they, uh, they were uh, nested here. But the, the pairs have been sort of uh, in, the, in and around the place for, for a few weeks. And then females would disappear and they, you'd find the, the odd male just sitting around, loafing around there, fast asleep, just trying to eke out his time. So the females were away. So I was very suspicious about them breeding here. But when I, first, when I saw the first broods, uh, which was kind of uh, into, into last week, I got in touch with my, fa- my pals on, the, on Coquit Island to see if any of the, the young birds had left there, the young eiders had left there. But they hadn't got any fledged at, at that point, so I knew these birds were, were locally bred. Uh, and it's tremendous, really. Uh, and as I say, there's, there's, a, there's, a, there's five or six broods here, I'm sure. Uh, and what they do, they, they, they crash. They'll bring several broods together of, of a variety of sizes. And the females... 
uh, will generally look after them. The males tend not to, to, to get involved in such things. But the non-breeding females um, are act as aunties, if you like, and they, they will help in raising the young. They'll, they'll have a, um, this overlook of them. And so there'll be four or five female adults um, around a brood of young ones. And they've got this super little noise they make. They'll, and the, 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 the females will pop, 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 pop. And they'll pop, 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 just like an outboard motor in a way, this, this slow drawl of an outboard motor. And that little call is just to keep the young ones together. Uh, you know, we, we were, we're quite familiar of the of the male calls and they'll, well, when they're in the display of, ooh, ooh, they do all of that business. But the females have this, bop, 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 which is great. Uh, and it, it's lovely. And so they're out there sort of sitting around and you see these little bundles of black fluff. Um, they're much darker than any of the other um, uh, duck species that we'll have nesting around the area. Um, and it's great to see them. And they're just scooting around on the surface of the water. The females are, are kind of are, are catching crabs and things for them. But they're, they're, they're doing their own thing now. They're kind of just they're foraging away. Uh, and they have this, uh, this, this great sort of lifestyle. But, of course, there is an attrition. So we do lose a few out of the, out of the brood, uh, out of the brood. So there is a, you know, a few do die. And I remember a number of years ago when I was working on, the, on Druidge Bay, people knew me as the bird man. And this, this, this lady brought me a, an eider duckling that had got dis, um, separated from its, from its parents. And it's typical of this time of year. Um, so she brought it to me thinking I could do something with it. And I was thinking, well, what can I do? So, but I had this idea that uh, I knew there were uh, eider ducklings on the, on the coquid estuary. This was, this was back in the, uh, in the late 80s. And I, and I knew there was young ones there. So I took this, this, this wee one, this wee Ida with me, and I went down and got to the, to the shore. The, the tide was well up, and I threw this Ida duckling as hard as I possibly could towards the, uh, an existing brood uh, and the aunties. So I threw it as hard as I could, and it just drifted through the air and eventually plopped. But as soon as it hit the water... It made the it started making this noise, pop, 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 and, this, the, and the females come, uh, came shooting round it, round it, and gathered it into the into the crash. I knew they would do that if they could get close enough to it, and sure enough, that's what exactly what they did. And I was thrilled at bits that the the uh, these females had <laughs> gone according to plan, just, just as they would, and they pop, 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 and off they went and gathered this young one in, and it was gathered into the into the crash. Goodness knows, only knows if it survived. I'm, I'm hoping it did, but uh, you never know. Um, but it had a better chance out there with them than it did with me. But it's, it's great to think that they've got this, this great maternal instinct, these, these aunties um, kind of gathering in these, these, other, <laughs> these other young birds. It's great. So, so when you're out and about down on, the, on these estuaries, in Coconut Estuary and the, uh, on the Alm Estuary, and there are a lot of young birds around, and I was hearing this morning there's over a hundred Ida ducklings on the Cogut Estuary currently, and there's about um, uh, forty plus here on the on the Alm Estuary. So have a look out and and just check them out. If the tide's down, you'll see little gatherings of them on the uh, on the mud as well, just whilst they're waiting for the tide to come back in and and get uh, uh, and, and start feeding again. Ah, it's brilliant. So the air, the Idas, the county bird of Northumberland. They're breeding right down into the River Blythe these days on the East Coast. That's the most southerly point we know of uh, on the East Coast where they breed. What a success story. And the county bird of Northumberland. Great stuff. Tom's taking a safety check on all things in the garden this week and his message is enjoy but take care with power tools, plants and all. He's not being a killjoy, it's more keep the joy. Tom says being safe really matters. I mentioned the problems associated with chemicals, garden chemicals, especially liquid type Never decant them from the original container into a bottle or jar. And if you did so, for goodness sake, get them labelled and keep them well away from children. Lock all your chemicals up in a safe place. Take great care when handling them. 
The other big problem, a serious problem, is power-driven tools. The moving parts, the hedge strimmer, the strimmers, the mowers, used protective clothing, cover your head for any debris flying if you're strimming, a face mask if possible, because the cut parts go everywhere and hedge clipping for goodness sake ha also have if it's not a shield over your face have some protective eye gear put gloves on and make sure you have tough boots none of this cutting grass or hedges or anything of the nature with sandals on bare feet just asking for trouble and use an rcd a residual current device this is a just an ordinary socket, uh, a plug which you push into a socket, into the mains, and then you put your uh, plug for, of your device you're using, say the hedge trimmer or the lawn mower, you plug it into that. And if there's any short circuit or any problem with the cable, say you're cutting a hedge and you cut through the cable accidentally because you're talking to the neighbour over the hedge, the electric current cuts out immediately rather than leaving bare wire which will can cause death buy that rcd they get them for about 20 25 pounds what price do you put on your life i'd hope more than that back strain and simple things like that through lifting heavy materials or pots for example that's a fairly common statistic people su suffering injury get a sack barrel as i do a common sack barrel or a uh, better still um, a wheelbarrow and make sure you take things from A to B don't carry them lift things very carefully the garden pond don't miss that out if there's children around and of course that barbecue keep yourself and anyone else children especially safe around the barbecue nice social occasion could end up in disaster perhaps the darkest part of all this is your garden if it's uh, got a wealth of plants around there, mixed border, herbaceous perennials in there, shrubs, do you know them well? If not, find out something about them. Because plants can't protect themselves from the nibblers and suckers of this world. The nibblers being the deer, the rabbits, the hares, anything else that touches it. Eat the leaves. The plants are rigid in the ground. They can't move around. So they protect themselves by developing poisons for the sap suckers, such as the aphids. Unfortunately, those poisons can affect us as well in different ways. The Anic Garden, Poison Garden, has over a hundred plants, and they take tours around there, each one of them capable of having an adverse pharmacological effect on you, if they're imbibed or you touch them. Find out something about these plants, for goodness sake, as quickly as you can, especially if they're children going round the garden. Wear gloves when you're handling them. Wash your hands afterwards if you've been planting, because flowers, stems, leaves, roots, shoots, they're all poisonous in different dimensions. Lily of the valley, beautiful little flower at the moment, the late queen of England's, uh, favourite flower, but it's got 30 different poisons in there. Monkshood, desperate, can kill. Honeysuckle, mock orange, beans of castor oil plant, uh, or sinus communis as it's called botanically. Source of ricin, borage, lungwort, helenium, larkspur, ivy and pelagonium, their leaves. We're not imbibing those, they can cause an allergic reaction. You got to be so careful. Euphorbia rue. You rue the day you broke the stem and it, and you got the white sap on your hand. This is the darker side of gardening, but it has to be mentioned. If a single person is saved injury, let alone a visit the hospital, because they've been listening to this, then that will keep me very happy indeed. And now for something different this week no poisons instead here's a reflection on the beautiful cherry tree festival at the Annick garden with john knox and dean smith 
So the Taihaku Cherry Orchard at Annie Garden was planted in 2008 as part of the Duchess's vision. As you stand in the orchard looking around, you can see it's the largest of its kind in the world, featuring 329 Taihaku Cherry Trees. It was the Duchess's vision to create a space that showcases the stunning blossom of these rare trees and celebrate their history. As we look at the, the cherry trees themselves, you'll see the lower half, or the kind of main stem of the tree, is actually different to the, the upper part of the tree where you get the, the, the blossom actually coming out. And that's because it's two trees grafted into one. So this grafting process is to make the tree hardier. The, the Japanese version... Taihaku wouldn't survive in our climate otherwise. It's too cold during the winter. So they take a, a, a hardier cherry tree, use that as the base or the, the rootstock, and then they use a section of tree from the Taihaku called the Scion, which is the upper area where you, you, get, you get the flowers coming out, and they graft them together, matching up as much as they can the rings so that you can get the, the flow of the water and the nutrients from one part of the tree to the other. Then they wrap it in special gardener's tape and they leave it to, to melt together or weld together over time. And then the two pieces grow together and become one tree. The new tree is strong, like the Dutch cherry blossom it's based on, but has the beautiful flowers of the Japanese cherry blossom. It's the perfect mix. So as you walk through the cherry orchard, you'll see 50 bench swing seats, and um, the Duchess was in, uh, inspired to put these in after witnessing an elderly couple in the orchard. The wife was sitting on the lush green grass, watching as her husband tenderly collected the delicate fallen blossoms to present to her. Touched by the romantic gesture and the couple's love for each other, the Duchess decided to provide seating that would allow visitors to enjoy the enchanting beauty of the blossoms up close. And so 50 swing seats were installed throughout the orchard providing the perfect spot for couples to sit hand in hand. Enveloped by the gentle swaying of the branches overhead, the soft, fragrant petals fluttering around them. And with each gentle breeze, the petals dance through the air, creating a serene and unforgettable experience for all who visit. In 1926, cherry blossom enthusiast Colin Wood Ingram was invited to Japan to give a lecture to the Cherry Blossom Society. While in Japan, he met with Seisaku Fanatsu, an elderly gentleman he described as being the founding head of Cherry Law. The meeting took place outside his home in Tokyo. Collingwood was shown a 120-year-old scroll painting of a particularly prized variety of cherry, which had been lost to cultivation. Almost unbelievably, Ingram recognised the tree, and he said, I've got that in my garden. His polite host didn't question this assertion, but his doubt was evident. Ingram also learned the tree he called Taihaku, meaning great white, was also known in Japan as Akatsuki, meaning daybreak or dawn. Ingram had acquired his tree from two cherry fanciers in Sussex, who had first heard about it in 1899 from growers in Provence, France. Their own ageing tree was in poor condition, but Ingram took pieces for grafting and soon had it grown well. Unfortunately, the first grafts he sent to Japan arrived dead, killed by the heat at the equator, or rotted. Finally, in 1932, he tried pressing the bottom ends of the grafts into cut potatoes and sent them via the Trans-Siberian Railway, a cooler route than by sea. Success! Unfortunately, in 1929... Seisaku Fanatsu had passed away. He never got to see the reintroduction of the Taihaku back to Japan. And the, the Taihaku still flower in Kyoto today. And that one tree in England has given way to repopulating the whole world. As the sun begins to set on the Anik Garden, a deeply poignant and emotional stirring dedication ceremony unfolds in the resplendent cherry blossom orchard. Each year, this heartfelt event is graced by the presence of the Duchess, the local vicar, and occasionally the Japanese ambassador. The ceremony is a true testament to the love and remembrance of those who have passed, and it is an honour to witness such a beautiful, meaningful display. 
Upon arrival at the atrium, hundreds of attendees are warmly greeted by our dedicated volunteers who present them with delicate paper boats, each bearing a small candle. The guests gather on the atrium steps before commencing their solemn procession around the garden in an anti-clockwise direction, ultimately leading to the enchanting cherry orchard. Families search for the trees they have sponsored, playing tribute with vibrant floral offerings and moments of quiet reflection. Once the time for remembrance has passed, the assembly converges on the verdant expanse of grass which overlooks the serene pond. The gentle voice of the vicar fills the air, offering words of solace and unity. This is the Nature Garden Podcast. Birds need good habitats to thrive and we can all do our bit to help, creating places for them to nest, roost and feed. And Tom Cadwallader brings us an inspirational tale about nesting and the pied flycatcher. We all know how easy it is to lose touch with people and it happens happens regularly, I'm sure, to, to lots of people. And I'm just like everyone else and time just slips through your fingers and before you know what's happened, it's gone years before you've, you've had any contact with folks. So I was really pleasantly surprised and oh, really overjoyed when I got an email from a pal uh, who lives in Hobart, Tasmania now. And I haven't seen him for ages. Uh, but we, uh, we were big pals back in the late 70s and early 80s. In fact, I, I trained him to ring birds as part of a scientific study. Uh, and uh, yes, gosh, a long, long time ago. But anyway, he reminded me of, uh, of nest boxes we used to have um, in the Wansbeck Valley. Now, nest boxes we had, you know, they're just your regular um, small wooden nest boxes with holes in the front. And we had about 50 or 60 in this little wooded area behind or west of, of Morbeth. And the idea was that we're going to try and create some kind of nesting habitat for, for a range of species. Now, the vast majority of these, these nest boxes were taken up by, uh, uh, by blue tits and grey tits, um, kind of normal sort of resident species. But we knew there was a small population of pied flycatchers. Now, pied flycatchers are, are beautiful little birds, and they're about five, six inches uh, high, but as the name suggests, pied, they're, they're black and white. They're white underneath, the males are white underneath and have this gorgeous sort of really deep black um, backs to them with a little white um, flashes on the wing and a little bit of white on the forehead. And the, this contrast is, is absolutely fabulous. And the females um, are uh, all are brown with this white underneath. So the, the brown replaces the, the black uh, of the male. So these birds are trans-Saharan migrants. So they'll go down to um, uh, south of the Sahara for, for the winter. And the population that we had uh, in, the, uh, uh, in this west of, of, of Morpeth was kind of the northern fringes, if you like, of um, the national population. They really do enjoy uh, deciduous woodlands and oak woodlands in particular. And so it's quite a specialist habitat. And there's loads of that habitat in, through Wales and, and uh, through into Cumbria. But we haven't got an awful lot in, in Northumberland. Um, so there was just this, this small kind of uh, fringe population, if you like. But anyway, so we, we, we had these nest boxes. And we were getting the, the pied flycatchers nesting in them. Um, there must be had, had about a dozen pairs uh, in this about... Um, and there's about sort of uh, 50 or 60 nest boxes. Uh, and it was great. So this was an annual occurrence. So uh, we were really pleased with ourselves. Now, the, the, the pied flycatchers are going through um, a bit of a... At the time, they're going through a bit of a range expansion. And this was largely driven by the provision of nest boxes. Uh, and the, the population did increase. And it's interesting that they had their life cycles 
were were kind of timed to um, to have young just when the right sort of food was available. They like to they whilst the adults will will fly and catch flies uh, on the wing, and they also f- um, feed off uh, in other invertebrates on the ground and on, on trees and things. So when the young are around, they will go and catch uh, uh, caterpillars. Uh, and the, um, they'll feed them almost entirely on particular species of, of oak um, uh, dependent uh, caterpillars, uh, and so that was that was quite interesting. So they, they, you've got to find the right place for these these birds to be, uh, and the timing is absolutely perfect. Um, but actually, the, the the first recording of uh, pied flycatchers breeding in the Thumbland was was in 1872. So you know the r- relatively recent sort of uh, colonizer. Um, and we've only got about 300 pairs in the county as a whole, which is quite interesting. Quite a sort of a, uh, a kind of a, uh, on the fringes of the, of the main population. So currently, though, the, uh, the pied flycatcher is, is under some pressure through, through climate change. Uh, and as I've described, the, uh, the linkage between feeding of caterpillars to the young is, is quite important with climate change there's just sort of skewing the um the timings of these things just ever so slightly and that's putting greater pressure on the brood size so it's it's quite a, a, a tough old gig for these these pied flycatchers and the beautiful birds but anyway back to the to the story um keith reminded me that whilst we're doing this nest box uh, scheme, uh, we worked on them for about 10 years, um, and whilst we were on there, what we tried to do was to ring all the young that were in the nest box, uh, but also try to uh, ring the, the female. The female would sit uh, quite tightly on the brood, we could lift her off and either ring her or ring the ring number, read the ring number that, was, that she had, because you know, we had been working on this for quite some time. But the males are a much trickier uh, proposition altogether because they're so they're kind of so susceptible uh, to any sort of disturbance. So we had to be very very careful. And what we used to do was to have um, uh, we would straighten out uh, a paper clip and put it on, make a little hinge, and we'd ha- have straighten the paper clip out and then make um, kind of like a pair of legs and we would fit this little hinge on the inside of the of the nest box hole and like a um, like a non re- non return valve which is <laughs> quite quite clever really quite a simple affair so the bird and uh, the first couple of three days of the the young ones hatching there's a real huge amount of activity going on there and both adults are, are going in that feeding like crazy and the male in particular whereas when the female's sitting he's hardly ever seen um, so yes so those first few days are quite uh, are quite important and we would time our visits to coincide with this as best we could and we would go and fit this little device inside the box this little no, no, non-return valve and we would sit and watch and we'd wait for the male to go in so he'd go and feed the young then he would try to get out again. Of course, he couldn't because of this non-return valve with this uh, uh, this little uh, uh, straightened out or uh, paperclip. So once we'd caught him, we uh, we'd go and, and, and take him out of the box quite carefully, quite uh, quite sort of gently. Um, but anyway, this one occasion that Keith was reminding me of was this bird had had a ring on when we got it out. Had a ring on, which is fantastic. And I read the ring number, and guess what? That pied flycatcher that male pied flycatcher i had ringed it the year before in that very same nest box so it was it had gone back and it was breeding and it's and its natal nest site not just in the area but actually in the nest box in the same tree in the same valley amazing so this bird had been down to west africa south of the sahara for its winter made its way all the way back to the same area, to the same tree, to the same nest box. Absolutely amazing. And when Keith reminded me of that, I was so thrilled. The fact that it had done all this journey, you know, something like sort of 8,000 miles, it just re- this return journey. And it just shows uh, how kind of loyal these birds are to the right habitat. But I think this pied flycatcher, it's this beautiful bird. This, these oh, they're, they're great. We hardly see them on the coast, you know. Um, because they, they, they really do breed in, in land. We occasionally see them on the coast during migration times, but it was a great thrill, and I'm really I'm so pleased that Keith reminded me of this little tale about pie flycatchers. And it's a tiny bird as well. So anyway, yes, 
what a great tale of, of migration. The, the kind of the natural history of birds, it just carries on without us, really does. And, and we can only glimpse to, into their kind of life cycles. Brilliant stuff, I loved that, I loved it. And to the sound of War Blackbird, here's Tom with some things to be getting on with in the garden. So it's jobs for the week time, and it's safe to say that you can plant out the last of those half hardy annual ornamental plants and vegetables that you've been hanging on to worry about the frost. There'll be no serious frost from here on in, even if there were a very cool night they would soon recover from it. The main thing is to monitor their development over the first two or three weeks after planting out, whether it's in a container or whether it's in the garden itself. It's water, water, water. Get a few days such as we've had recently with 20 plus Celsius during midday and for the better part of the day and they soon dry out. So a little bit of tender loving care, TLC, until they're established. Uh, the first batch of outdoor lettuce we sowed about six, yeah, six weeks ago has um, it germinated, of course. We've been using it quite a lot. It's a leaf lettuce type, uh, so you can cut and come again. It keeps on producing. Uh, if you leave that too long without water, there's a bit, a bit of bitterness comes into the taste of the leaves. So make sure it's got plenty of water. The other thing is, although it looks brilliant at the moment and we're harvesting it almost daily for sandwiches and for salads, there has to be a succession because in two, three, four weeks' time and months' time, it will be just getting a little bit old, even though it keeps on reproducing. And it's lovely to have the continuity of a new batch. So I've got a space alongside these rows with the red and green leaved um, salad bowl, lettuce in there, and lolorosa type, the red one, and I'm going to sow a drill of young seeds there. Water the drill before you put the seeds in, just so it has a flying start when it's when it's dry like this, and then cover them over, and within three to four weeks, you can start to harvest those micro leaves, and that will keep you going as they grow, with quite a few cut and come again, as I mentioned, or for a couple of months. Then you get another sowing in, fresh seeds sown uh, before we went too far into summer. The first early potatoes, um, I'm watching them for watering at the moment. They've got good, some good growth on them. Uh, the horns of them, the shores, the foliage above ground, they're about oh, 45 centimetres, heading for towards 60 centimetres uh, eventually. They're looking good, they're looking green. Here, water is the important bit. If I get, if I'm allowed to get the hose out, which we are here, then I'll water them every two or three days just to make sure there's plenty of water going into the developing tubers below ground level. And one thing to look out for is potato blight. You'll see when it occurs, generally in this part of Northumberland, it it pops up on the air, the spores, and they alight on the on the foliage and the plant starts to wilt as if it were dry, and the rest of the plants around it are looking very turgid, full of water. That's a sign of, sign of blight. I expect that to start appearing, if it's coming, about the last week in June, just when we're digging the first tip of the crop, and first, second week in July. Out with the top of that plant, and salvage whatever tubers it developed beneath. That's the best way to control any blight that comes in. I'm ventilating the greenhouse, Daily, I'm removing the side shoots from tomatoes and vines so that all the goodness that's there, the food that's coming into the plant, being manufactured through photosynthesis, is going into the developing grapes and into the developing tomato plants. Move the side shoots almost daily. I was, uh, damping down there, I put water on the flagstones to make sure that the temperature Keep is, is low and ventilate for a good circulation of air to avoid any development of mould or anything of that nature. I'm mowing the lawns weekly. Low, the cutting blades are down to the summer level now and keep them cut weekly and you keep on top of them. Even if you've had the um, no-may cutting, 
which has been suggested, then you can get back to normal now and keep cutting each week. Uh, monitor containers outside for water daily because they can dry out very quickly, more so it's not the soil-based compost you're using. Uh, take stem cuttings of shrubs and such as choicer ternata, which has got some lovely side shoots on now, and net those strawberries to, so the birds, the blackbirds especially, don't get the lion's share. Now, whatever you're doing in the garden, over the coming week, enjoy it. You've been listening to gardener Tom Pattinson, birder Tom Cadwallander from the British Trust for Ornithology, and John Knox and Dean Smith from the Annick Poison Garden. I'm Carl Steinson, and don't forget you can listen back to all the previous reports we've done on the Nature Garden podcast. Enjoy your gardening and time outdoors with nature. Bye for now.